Is that loud enough? Or should, no, I think we're good. OK. Um, so. So as my, my slides come up, um, very similar to what was just spoken about, I'm going to take another approach, which is instead of looking at individuals and um, particular behavioral outcomes, trying to use harvestable data, similarly, but in this case, um, city administrative data, to try to see the landscape of the city, right? to understand um, and track disparities in outcomes and conditions uh, across neighborhoods. Um, and once we come up, I actually want to start with a quick video to capture um, kind of this idea. Uh, and before I get there, I will, I will admit openly um, I was a co-author on this video. I, I provided the data and, and some of its organization. Um, my colleague, Mauro Martino, who is an expert visualizer, is responsible for the actual, the, the sexiness, if you will. Um, There we go. And then will my, my PowerPoint come up when I switch to it? OK. So I'm going to show you a video of um, how many people here have heard of a 311 hotline? OK, so quite a few of you. Um, so these are all the calls received by Boston's 311 hotline in 2011. Um, these are requests for non-emergency government service. Everything from street light outages to bed bugs to trees falling down to you know, broken uh, signs, potholes, all sorts of things. And it, it's a pretty amazing little dance to watch here, right? As you, as you watch the year pass, right? That green flash there was a hurricane where all the trees fell down on the city, about 1,400. Uh, you know, it's, it's this amazing thing to watch. But the thing, especially when I show this to my students, that I ask them is, what did you learn? Right? And the answer is probably not very much. I generally come up with the fact that you can't geocode anything inside the airport or inside this big park, zoo, and golf course down here. Otherwise, it's really just a mess of really, really rich and valuable, but yet disorganized and unstructured information. Right? Every one of those points is a specific event or condition at a location and a time, but in the aggregate, you have to organize them. You have to approach them in some way to figure out what they really do um, and what they're really telling you about the city. Um, so the, the point of my talk, then, is to ask the question, two questions. Right? What can these data actually measure? And I'm going to use 311 as my main example, but this is true of all of the different data sets that are streaming into the city on a daily basis. Right? 911 calls, tax assessments, uh, police records, health records, school records, all of these things are just coming in constantly. Um, and the question is, how can we make them relevant to science, policy, and practice? Um, so to give you a little bit of background, uh, this whole project kind of sits under a bigger umbrella of something called the Boston Area Research Initiative. It's an inter-university partnership that pursues urban research that advances both scholarship and policy. That was our original mandate. But then we realized that there was a very special opportunity presented by novel digital data, that both the scholars and the policymakers were looking at this resource and saying, what can we do? And kind of salivating at the mouth, if you will, uh, in doing so. So it was a great opportunity for both of these sectors to come together. Uh, it is directed by Rob Sampson and Chris Winship, both professors of sociology at Harvard University, and myself, I'm the research director. Um, faculty and policymakers representing 10 area universities and 15 government agencies are involved and we're seated at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. And if you want to learn more, you can go visit our website, bostonareresearchinitiative.net. Um, but so basically this starts in around 2010, 2011. We sit down with the city and we look at this new data set, this 311 data set, which is very well curated. They're receiving 175,000 calls a year and we say, what can we do here? And as as someone with an urban uh, neighborhood background, the first thing I said, well, this is broken windows, right? This is physical disorder that we're looking at right here. Um, the basic reports of the deterioration of the spaces of the neighborhood. So what could we do with that? And so we immediately turned to ecometrics, which many of you are very likely uh, familiar with. But basically, as the name suggests, it's, it's methodologies for measuring the social and physical conditions and characteristics of a neighborhood. So, this is, these are all pictures from Boston. This is a very narrow but well-trimmed street in Charlestown. 
This is a housing project in South Boston. This is a more suburban neighborhood down in Roslindale. And what ecometrics do is they allow you to take these obviously different places and quantify how they are different, right? Describe and define the dimensions that differentiate the city. And this is classically done with surveys of residents, systematic social observation. For those who aren't familiar with that term, it's hiring graduate and undergraduate students to go walk around with a clipboard and write things down. Uh, <laughs> it takes quite a bit of work. Uh, key informants or elite networks, right? Interview police officers, uh, post office workers, real estate agents, city council members about what the neighborhoods look like. Um, but then the question was, could we do something new with this administrative data? Could we have a new form of ecometric science here? Which was really um, exciting because these other traditional approaches take hundreds of thousands of dollars to cover a city and you can never really do it in anything shorter than a year and no one's ever succeeded in doing the same city more than twice in 10 years um, because it takes so much resources and energy and these data are coming in every day. So is there an opportunity here? So, in ecometric methodology, well, what exactly is missing here? Because these aren't research data, right? They weren't collected for the purpose of knowledge. They're collected to run a, an administrative system. So you're going to have weaknesses in the data in terms of research quality. So we, in a paper that recently came out in sociological methodology, uh, we defined, identified three issues that need to be dealt with here. First one was content, right? Going back to that kind of mess of dots that I had on the screen, what is it among this mess that you actually want to isolate and pull out? Could we isolate disorder from calls like, what is the uh, mayor's birthday, which actually comes in on occasion? Um, validity. Do the cases measure real conditions, right? This is the city as seen through the eyes of the caller. And I'll talk about this a little bit more later. But that's not necessarily what the city actually looks like. Um, and third, reliability, which I'll talk about the least today, but these data don't come with rules about how often and how large of a space you should be measuring over. Is it a street? Is it a census tract? Is it a day? Is it a year? Is it 10 years? What are you able to actually measure? Um, I'm happy to talk about that later. I'm probably not going to talk about it very much during my talk. So as a pilot, we took about two and change years of data, 335,000 cases. Uh, each case includes date and time address or intersection, a standardized case type, which allows us to know the content of the call, um, and the, an anonymous caller identifier, which actually comes in really handy later. I'll talk about that. But it basically connects everyone's calls to them. So if I've made five calls, they're connected to a single person. Um, they don't necessarily know that it's Dan O'Brien, but it's one person. Um, the analysis uses census block groups. There's 543 in Boston. Um, and so our first step, this issue of content, was identifying and categorizing relevant case types. Right? There's 178 case types, and we narrowed it down to about 29 that were important, um, given our focus on broken windows and disorder. And they actually broke out into two broad groupings that had five subgroupings. Right? The first two, trash and graffiti, hung together in something we referred to as public denigration. Now, for those who are stats nerds, this is all done with confirmatory factor analysis. I can talk about that later. Um, and then the other three that came together were these private issues, right? Housing issues, bed bugs, unsatisfactory living conditions, uncivil use of space, people using their private space in ways that impinge on the public domain, um, and problems with big buildings, things like apartments and such. And this is actually special, I'll note quickly, because most previous work is looking at the public space, things that can be seen from the sidewalk. This is actually allowing us to see deterioration from inside the house, which is very special. Um, second step, so we have these categories, but are they valid? And just to illustrate quickly, imagine that there's a streetlight outage down in Jamaica Plain there, gets called in, and a streetlight outage over in South Boston does not get called in. As far as the database is concerned, there's no streetlight out in South Boston. Right? And so you can imagine how this can create deficiencies in measuring, and you can also imagine how this will create over-measuring, right? If you have, I don't know how many people are here from New York, but I like to reference the neighborhood Yenta. Um, you know, you have someone, someone who, who likes to keep track of things and may call five, six, seven times before something gets fixed. That appears in the database as five, six, seven streetlight outages. And so you have to kind of adjust for these things. So we figured we had to adjust for a civic responsiveness. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so first thing we needed was an objective measurement of response rate. Now, this is really key. Somehow I convinced 
nine undergraduate students to walk around the city with me at twilight over the course of a summer. Uh, and we identified 244 streetlight outages across Boston. I'm still not sure how I convinced them to do that project, uh, but, but it was a lot of fun. Uh, and, and then Public Works at the same time was assessing the quality of all sidewalks. And what you can do is you can take these two data sets and cross-reference them with the call reports and figure out which items were actually called in and how quickly and which ones were not to give you an objective measure of civic response rate. And then we, we decided, you know, we don't want to have to do this, right, every time we want to measure disorder to adjust. We want to be able to approximate that from within the system so that we can constantly run this in an automated fashion. So we developed additional measures from within the 3.1 database to estimate civic response rate. And this include registered users reporting public issues, what I like to call custodians, um, and registered users reporting more than two public issues a year, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's actually the top 9% of the database. Uh, and I, I refer to those as exemplar custodians. And these two groups actually represent kind of the neighborhood's resource in terms of being responsive to issues in the city. And so this map actually shows you the estimated response rate from those measures. And so you can see areas of dark green. Basically what that is is if there's a street light outage, a pothole, an instance of graffiti, you're more likely to get a report and quicker. And areas that are pale um, are less likely to have those reports made and they will take longer. Um, and so this was then, I can spare you the method methodological details, but this is then used as a volume knob, uh, turning up the number of reports to reflect the fact that there's a low response rate and turning down the number of reports to reflect where there's an overabundance of reporting. Um, and then very quickly, we can talk about this later if people want to go through the details, but we had to revalidate, right, do some construct validity against does this actually look like what's supposed to, and we found it correlated with everything it was supposed to uh, quite robustly. So what did we end up with in the end? We had these final measures of physical disorder. It was multidimensional, which is important because no measure of physical disorder previously has been multidimensional. It's always been one thing, physical disorder, and this actually gives us more nuance in the measurement. It's nearly costless, right? The original study took quite a lot of work, but I updated the 2014 uh, about a month or two ago with a student, and it took us a week of literally just bring in the data, geocode it, fix it. It took about 10 hours of his time. Um, and not a lot of work. Um, and continuous across time and space. We can measure them every two to six months. And remember earlier I said no city had ever been measured uh, comprehensively more than twice in 10 years. This allows constant tracking. Um, so then we have this. We have these two maps of the city, private neglect and public denigration. Um, but obviously, as, as I kind of alluded to earlier, there's lots of data sets of this sort. We're clearly not going to stop here. Um, so we're building a broader library of eco-metrics based on administrative data and, and other uh, methodologies. But from 311, we've got physical disorder, engagement, custodianship. From 911, we have a series of measures of so social disorder and crime and another one on medical emergencies, which I'm happy to talk about more. Building permits, I had a student develop metrics of investment and growth. Business licenses, another student decided to develop a measure of local business density. Uh, restaurant inspections for food quality access, and a fun one, Arts Boston events calendar for cultural vibrancy across the city. Um, so to wrap up here, what do we now use these for? Right? What, what do we do next? And I have five suggestions of what the next steps are for science policy and practice with these kind of modern ecometrics. First one is interpreting microspatial patterns, right? Ecometrics are intended to measure the ecology itself, but what if we turn that around and ask how much each location is contributing to that ecology? Um, so here we have a map of major medical emergencies. Those are the orange dots at addresses in uh, South Boston mapped with the level of physical disorder. And can you tease out these really microspatial relationships that, you know, they are the the center point of causality that we all want to get to. Um, number two, examining dynamic relationships. All of these measures can be tracked annually. We have an annual tracking going. We have right now 2010 through 2014 complete. Soon we'll have 2015. And we've been currently testing broken windows theory. Does disorder actually lead to more crime? Does disorder actually lead to more medical emergencies? over time, as the theory would argue. We had a paper come out about this earlier this summer, and it turns out it's not public disorder that matters so much. It's private disorder, and that's something we didn't have access to before. Um, 
combining with traditional methodologies, right? Uh, let's merge the big data with small data that we know what it means and we give greater interpretation to this wealth of information that we now have. And we've done a survey of 311 users and we've been looking at what the actual motivations for making these different types of calls are. Um, supporting neighborhood interventions and experiments. And I think Mark captured this a little bit in his talk as well. Right? There's this great opportunity where the data are streaming in. The before data already exist and the after data are coming soon enough. Right? And so you can actually track changes across a neighborhood based on an intervention, based on a policy experiment of some sort and learn quite a bit. And it saves you some methodological time of pre-measurement and post-measurement. Um, and last, from methodology to dashboards, right? And I, I want to refer back to what Anna said at the way beginning um, about right to the city, and in this case, it's right to the city's data, right? The city itself is generating the data. Um, the people of the city, their neighborhoods, are described by the data, and it's their daily lives that are being described. So we as academics, we see it as our duty to be funneling this back to the city of Boston, uh, as an entity and helping them incorporate it into dashboards and daily operations and long-term planning. But also we have a public-facing um, internet platform, interactive map where we post all of our measures and we're starting to do uh, community group trainings to show groups how to access these data and interpret them to better understand what's going on in their neighborhoods. So with that all said, uh, thank you all for your attention. Uh, just give credit where credit is due, my, my series of policy collaborators. Um, and my various research partners on the project. Um, and thank you.